I came up with the greatest saying ever. What? I, I tried to um, distill for my children, we have four children, what are the keys to success? And, and please give me credit for this. If we, this should be a billboard, this should okay. be written on people's walls. People should get this as a tattoo. And it's so simple. Number one. He's been giving me a lot of little nuggets before we started, so I just wanted to make sure we get it. Okay, so tell us so, what you're yeah, for. Yeah, so four children, and um, oldest is 16, 14, 13, and nine, two boys, two girls, and trying to do the best I can, right? You never know. Right. My parent wrote a parenting book, but now I reflect back on it, and I'm like, what the hell do I know? Um, you should but, have brought it. I never saw the parenting book. I heard about it. You yeah. talked about it on Rich Roll's podcast a lot. Yeah. But I never got what copy. I mean, the, or, the basic gist of the parenting book is we should put obstacles in front of our children, not remove them. Right. But even, even as a parent, even, even as a parent that lives the Spartan lifestyle and pushes Spartan to the whole world, I still have tendencies like every parent where like, you want to protect your kid. You, of course. Like, and so I have to fight my own instincts. But I don't know. A couple of weeks ago, I was... I was thinking, okay, we have this little family chat text thing where my wife and my kids are in it. And so we text. In yeah, there. yeah, yeah. Throughout the day or Throughout the day, we just yeah. sent, sent, like, I just sent them a picture of pizza because I'm trying to teach my kids um, about business. I'm like, hey, if we opened a pizza place, this is the kind of pizza. What do you guys think? Right. But anyway, <laughs> I, I said, how do, how do I send them a message in this text chat that distills the keys to success? I'm on the planet 53 years. I've had all this amazing luck with all the things I've done. And I was like, oh, I, I think I know what the three things are. And, and please give me credit for this. If we, this should be a billboard. This should okay. be written on people's walls. People should get this as a tattoo. And it's so simple. Number one, communicate like a movie star. Like if Denzel Washington was sitting here and he got up in front of him, all of a sudden you're captivated the way they communicate. They look you in the eyes. They make you feel like you're the most important person. Like movie stars, I don't know if that's a term you use anymore here in Hollywood, but um, celebrities, they know how to communicate. Not all right? of them. Not all of them. Now, but, 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 but I know what you're saying. You're saying like the old school movie stars, the people like the, the ones who... Like the A-list select movie stars, A -list like a movie Tom star. Cruise or a Denzel. Do we use that term here in I, Hollywood? I mean, I guess so. Movie I mean, star. the problem is so the word celebrity is very, now it's very overused. Anyone could be a celebrity if you're on social media. A-list, now I, I'm, I'm A-list. Uh, movie stars. Movie stars. Okay. Communicate like a movie star, number one. So I think we would agree on yes, that. Yes, I would agree uh, on that Number one. two, and this is going to be politically incorrect. I apologize. I don't know another way to say it. Work like an immigrant. You know, when I had my swimming pool business in my teens, I hired lots of neighborhood kids. They were all disasters, including my own family. Um, when I hired these two kids from Poland, they outworked me. They didn't, right. even, they didn't even own the business. They were unbelievable. And I quickly learned that that work ethic is who I want to be around. That's how we get things done. Yeah. And by the way, I don't care if they're American or Chinese or, or Korean. It doesn't no, matter. But to me. I know what you're saying. It's like when you have, when the, when the immigrant mindset is like, they are so they feel so lucky to be given an opportunity. So they work so hard and they work, their work ethic is above and beyond. By the way, I'm Canadian and I will tell you, even me coming to the US, I'm not considered an, an immigrant in the way you're thinking, but still it's like you have this appreciation. So you kind of, and you need to like make a living. So you have that. You, you're you have fighting that, for milk. You actually, exactly. So you, you have like an ingrained grit. Yep. That's what it is. And so, and so communicate like a movie star, um, work like an immigrant, and then have gratitude like a monk. If you, if you do, you know, if, you, if you're grateful, every day for what you have. Um, and you do those three things, you're like, you got life knocked. It's yeah. That, it's that simple. Like there's nothing else to, we, we don't need to talk about it. You could shut down Instagram at this point because all you need is those three things. We don't need social media anymore. We don't need anything. We don't need lessons from anybody anymore. All the morning shows, the late night right, shows. Yeah, no, do these fine. three things. That's it. I, Stop writing books. We're good. Just those three things. That's it. So like, why don't you, why don't you write a book I was going to write that. a book, one page. Yeah. <laughs> it was just going exactly. to be a postcard. <laughs> it was going to be a postcard. It's more right. like a postcard. Yeah. Well, I can't even imagine you being my, like, a, my a fault. Like, the kind of parent you must be. Like, you said you wrote the parenting book. I never saw it, really. But I did hear you talk about it. That doesn't really help, like, somebody's ego. Like, I'm, I'm here as a guest on your show. And like, you're like, I didn't even read it. I didn't see it. Well, I, only don't, because I don't really care about let's it. Let's tell like, everyone how this happened. We were doing a podcast prior to this podcast. And um, actually, 
it was terrible internet and that's why we're now lucky. I'm fortunate. I'm very fortunate that yeah. you came to, you came to do this in person and I did know you had a parenting book, but it, by the time that I wasn't expecting you to be here so quickly because yeah. we only talked on the phone like five days ago. I would have actually got the parenting book and read it. Well, I was thinking you would have had the parenting book from like a year ago when I wrote it because it was that popular no. and it was such a big hit that maybe you would have heard about it. No, That's well, all. you know, because you ghosted me. Let's let's see if we take it back a little <laughs> bit. So I would have had that. Actually, I would have had the parenting book had I known uh, about it through you. But since when we met in 2018 and we right. became fast friends and then you basically like dropped me like a hot potato four months or six months later, um, I kind of like was angry and like, res you know, and just kind but, of like but, went but my the, own the, way. The truth of the matter is, although you're not going to believe it based on your tone, um, <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the truth of the matter is um, because I get so many messages, true, true story. Mm -hmm. and you could ask my kids, my phone would lock up on text for some reason. It kept locking. I went into Apple five times. They erased everything. They gave me a new phone. When they did that, your name disappeared like 500 other people. Yeah, so, okay. I, so I didn't see it. I don't know. Fair enough. Right? Although email. But the world did know about the book. Yeah, the like world. they didn't need me to text them the about the book. It <laughs> well, was listen, <laughs> the world, I mean, listen, that's true, true, true. However, there's so many books that come out. And because right. I was, I already had like my backup towards you because you like basically just, like I said, ghosted me. That's what the kids say these days. How many times did you, because when I, when we finally caught up again on text, I could look at it now. It wasn't like you sent three texts. It was like, I didn't respond to one of them. And all of a sudden that was it. No, it was two. <laughs> It was two. So that no, after oh, two, you just shut a person no, no, down. No, like, I happened. mean, what if I was in Greece? I will tell you more. I right. will tell you why. Right. I emailed you. Yeah. And and I think Susan was on that email, but I, I was totally just ignored. And social media. Remember, I asked you about social media, and I you told me I don't you don't check, check my check social, your social media. I'm surprised on the email though. That's that's surprising. See, it was like it was a three plethora of right. different things. So three different ways you try to communicate. Right. There was a pandemic. Yeah, but but therefore people right. were on their phones more. I wasn't. I was doing five live workouts a day. Had you been following me, yeah. <laughs> you would have you. known that. I was resent. I, I, told you, I built up some resentment towards you. Yes. And then when I finally got this, and I saw you on the computer, all all the all the love that I had for you in 2018 just came came Rushing barely back. back. Exactly. Yeah. But now you're very responsive. Now, if I actually text you, you respond. Well, I put your name back in my phone. Okay, and well, that's now good. I, I see your name Thank and, you. and I respond. I appreciate that no very problem. much. And, and the world should know. I tell people all the time, if I don't respond, I either missed it, which is rare, or I died. Oh, okay, those or are, you died. Are, yeah, that's it. <laughs> okay, that's, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. Okay, right. so tell me about how, what it's like, given the fact that I did not read your parenting book. And let's just pretend, you know, that um, maybe I, a couple people who are listening didn't, didn't read the parenting book. Highly either. unlikely. Yeah, I'm sure exactly. <laughs> maybe one or two people like missed it for yeah. some reason. But what can you tell? Like, what if I was your kid? What would I say? To what kind of dad you are? Are you like? Well, I can tell what kind of dad you are. But I'm not soft and cuddly, right? My wife would definitely complain about that. Okay. Uh, I don't have all those social cues of like hugging, and I, I just it's not me. Um, it's what, charming, actually. Though. What I am, what I am focused on is. Um, doing the work today so that we could uh, reap the rewards two years, five years from now. Um, and I'm really consistent. So we're getting up at 5.30 in the morning. I don't care about- Since what, but how old were they when they started this? Oh, three. Um, three years old. Yeah. You like wake them up at 5, 5.30. I, I, you know what, I, um, this is a crazy story. So I grew up in Queens, New York. Yeah. And my parents got divorced because my mom got into health, food, meditation, yoga, et cetera. And um, my dad said, your mother's a crackpot. And I didn't want any part of the like branch sandwiches and celery sticks. I wanted like, you know, rigatoni and, and ravioli and chicken parm. Yeah. Like, eggplant parm was my favorite. Yeah, and there was good. a Chinese restaurant in town called uh, Danny's Szechuan Garden. So anyway, Chinese food was like the thing. Once a week, you went and got Chinese food in the little white containers. And my dad said, listen, I got you an account. You and your sister got an account at the Chinese restaurant. So if you got to sneak away from your mother, you go eat some real food. So I became good friends, as you could imagine, with Danny, the Chinese guy at the restaurant. We became, for like a decade, my buddy. And uh, so I get married. We've got children. We're on this farm. Our first child's three. I'm watching Kill Bill with Uma Yeah, Thurman, yeah, I love that movie. Right? 
And Uma Thurman is carrying buckets of water up and down stairs and she's getting yelled at by her master. And I turned to my wife and I said, why don't we get a Kung Fu master to live with us? Wouldn't that be cool? The kids could be trained in Kung Fu. She said, how the fuck would we get a Kung I said, well, I know this Chinese guy in this neighborhood <laughs> I grew up in. So I called Danny, he's still got the restaurant. And oh he's like, God. oh no, no problem. Um, where we get all our staff, I could probably get you a Kung Fu master. He gets me a Kung Fu master. We fly him in from China and he lives on the farm with us. And the deal was 5.30 every morning, we're getting up, the kids are doing Kung Fu in the barn and 5.30 every night, seven days a week. And it just became a thing. If we were going somewhere, we took the Kung Fu master with us. Like it was like 365 days a year. And I wanted all the lessons to be done in Mandarin. So, wow. so, so that they, because I had read years earlier, I had read um, Pumping Iron, Arnold Schwarzenegger's yeah, yeah, book. Yeah. And, and I was fascinated with the fact that he learned English by watching um, American TV. So I said to my wife, you know, maybe the kids could learn Mandarin by if we just create this Mandarin environment. environment. And, and so all the television, which was excruciating to make happen, was in, you could watch as much TV as you want as long as it's Mandarin, which meant I had to go find DVDs when DVDs were a thing that um, were translated, uh, you know, uh, English yeah. shows oh, translated. Wow. So we, we, I went to China to get them, but then you had to have a different DVD play. It was like a nightmare. Netflix didn't have it at that it, time where you could just switch over. No, so we didn't have Netflix. At that time, we didn't even have Netflix. Yeah, well, they had right? Netflix, I think the video, like you could mail them in or something. Oh, but, the, the red. Um, but it's, all yeah. I'm saying is the, the level of commitment to stick, to say you're going to do something and then stick to it where it's not, not like 20% of the time, not 70%. 100% of the time, this is what we do. Like here I am in LA and my, I woke up this morning at like five and my, and my wife texted me. Um, she's like, oh, I missed the workout this morning because she knew I was going to find out that the kids missed the workout and I was going to lose my mind. Now, anybody normal listening to this would say, give it a break. Like who cares? But um, it's, it's the cumulative effect of doing things over and over and over again that really have tremendous outcomes. Um, consistency. Consistency. My, my oldest son is getting recruited um, to a couple of really good schools right now. Which ones? I don't want to mention, but, but um, which, is am which is amazing. And, and, it, and it's a solely because of what we did since he's three years old. Um, and certainly, look, wow. he, he's, got, um, he's, got, he's got lots of flaws, just like I do or you do. But, um, but the one thing that the common thread that we've done for 13 years is, you know, speak fluent Mandarin every single day, work out like a nut. And now he's a wrestler. And um, yeah, so it works. I, my point is it sucks. It's hard. Kids complain about it. But in the last three weeks, he sees, literally the last three weeks this has happened, he sees, oh my God, the outcome is unbelievable. I understand now why my father's a lunatic. No, number one. Okay, I just want to say something because I was teasing you before. This is why I really do like I. I really like you. I liked you from the second I met you because you you say what you do. You do what you say. Besides, of course, avoiding me. But like you are the real deal. Like you yeah. actually practice what you preach more than anybody I've ever seen. Like that. This is you and your DNA. Like they're not like faking it. By the it. way, by the way, um, I had a DNA test done recently and, and they give you the result, like personality results. Yeah. And they were like, this is exactly it. And I had a brain mapping thing done and they were like, same thing. Like, really? You are really like hardcore. What did the about. brain map say? What did the DNA say? What was um, the kind of test? It was, it was exactly that. It was like, you tend to get on things and then not let them go. And, and um, I am maniacal about that. And people can find that out? By and people can find that out. Yeah. So then, so that would answer another question of mine is that like, is it, does it have to be innate? Can someone learn the skill to be like well, that? Well, you know what, recently, it's a great question. And recently I've come up with a great answer. Okay. Um, you have children. How old are your children? Two children. Seven and nine. Seven and nine. They probably didn't want to brush their teeth at some point when they were growing up. Right. Like, they like still don't want to brush their teeth. I have to fight. Come, yeah. At some point that changes though. And they brush their teeth every right, day. Right. Like they do it like all the time. Do, right. Yeah. And so, yes. And my point is we can learn um, a commitment to things, a ritual, and then we do them over and over and over. But what it requires is somebody putting guardrails in place and dealing with the pain and suffering of, no, we're doing this. No, we're, do you know, my dad, when I was growing up, had uh, Rottweilers, 
don't ask me why in the neighborhood we were in, it was a, a common dog was to have a Rottweiler. Wow. And um, he, he, somehow he got a German trainer to come over. And so we learned from this German trainer how to train the dogs. Normally people send their dog to a trainer. The German trainer trained us on how to train the dogs. And anybody listening or watching this is gonna say I'm a real lunatic here, but kids are dogs, they're animals. We're, we are animals. And right. so no, it's just mean. a matter of training them over and over and over. And if you give in, and when they whine or complain, you let them do something else. Well, then you got to reteach them now. I, I, by, by the way, I, I actually agree with you wholeheartedly. I don't. People will also think I'm a lunatic, but I believe that you, if you, you can adapt and change your neuroplasticity at any time if you want to. Just to give you an example, yesterday my kids on this basketball team, right? Uh, you know, and he, he always got scared when he goes up to the to the, the um, loop, yeah, it's called to, the hoop. To hoop, I know, yeah. but to like actually <laughs> throw it, throw it, right. he hoop, pat, throw, hoop, throw. I know, right. by the way, I like work at the NBA. I did, so I should know these things, but um, he, he would pass it right when he's like, he's super aggressive and he's right. fast. Right. Yeah. So we'd get it all the way down to the, down, down the whole court. Right. Yeah. And then it be, be, he got, he gets scared to, to shoot. So then they'll pass. Yeah. Because he doesn't practice, I say you have to. If you practice, it would give you the the, the, the confidence, confidence right. and confidence. Bre you know, equals confidence. So right. if you do it over and over again, and he never want, never ever, uh, never wanted to do it. Finally, I'm like, you have to practice. Yesterday before the basketball thing, he, I said you have to do 500. You got to shoot 500 times outside. And he whined and bitched and moaned, but he did it. At, we went to the game and he went to the, he went to the hoop and he shot and shot and he made almost every shot because of the uh, practice. Because of the practice. Right. So that showed him that how, how important the, the, the practice is to change. Right. So what does he do the rest today? He, he practiced before school. There's been studies done by the way, you'll like this. Let's just go down this rabbit hole for a second is um, not only should you have him do 500 actual shots, but then he can close his eyes and, and, and do 500, Vision. visual shots Vi yep. and they're and they're powerful too um very as far as wiring the brain and and so um apparently there was a, a famous uh, russian tennis coach uh -huh. that would have the higher level kids um not even hit a ball anymore and they're just literally like swinging the racket and that would help develop really? them even further yeah so um so anyway just adding a tool to your no tool belt. to the tool belt to yeah. the tool, toolbox well no yeah. i think that's super important the problem is we're living in a very two things in, in a culture where it's all about video games it's all yeah. about ipads and to yeah. get people to to get off of that like i don't know if you've seen the stat but isn't it like more than 40 percent of kids now can't do what the kids uh in my time or your time like even like 20 years ago or 18 years no 10 years ago of course I mean, they're just, they're so lethargic. So I'm fighting, I'm, I'm just fighting that whole thing, not just in my house with our, with our four children, but, but um, our business. I mean, that's what we do is to try to get people off the right. couch and to do these things. And, and, um, and it's not easy because, um, so you might not know this, but, and I didn't know this, the human brain, the number one motivator for, for us is the avoidance of discomfort, mm -hmm. right? Which is why the phone is so uh, successful and why um, ice cream and Netflix and couches are so successful, right? Because they, right. they help us avoid discomfort. So you can see how we got here and, mm -hmm. um, and it's gonna require a couple of us to um, stand up and fight it. But that means there's gonna be people around us that say, uh, this is a crazy person. I can't believe he's pushing his kids like that. And I've had many instances over the years I mean, my oldest son was eight and he ran the Boston Marathon with me. And you could imagine the looks and the, like- Did the he look. really? Yeah. Is it the same eight-year-old who's now going to be getting into a undisclosed college that they want him, that, that kid? That same, yeah, same kid. Okay. Yeah. And then his brother at seven ran the New York Marathon. And then their sister ran one of our beast races when she was six, right? So- um, That's and by incredible. The, and by the way, I didn't put a collar around them and drag them, right? They didn't really- know what they were doing and you get a lot of looks and oh my God, the kid's gonna get hurt or this or that. You know how many kids in Africa are going, you know, 13 miles a day carrying buckets of water? Like stop, stop. Yeah. It's better that they sit on a device and sit on the couch for 
uh, 11 years of their life and do nothing. It's, I, I, you're preaching right? to the converted. Right. In fact, that's, that's what also is, is increasing mental health problems is the, is the iPad. My friend who's like this uh, very renowned child psychiatrist was saying that it's because of these video games and the, and all the, I, the, the addiction to like the, the screen that's creating depression, more depression. It's, it changes the, like the neurotransmitters in your brain. Well, what happens is, um, our brains are not designed to get as many dopamine hits as we get. Like when earlier, right. earlier in our generations on the planet, we would do work and we would find an orange. We would do work and we would kill an animal. And now you don't have to do any work. You hit Uber Eats, you hit Uber, you hit this, you hit that, and you're getting constant, constantly flooded with dopamine and that's got negative um, unintended consequences. Yeah. Yeah, um, there's a whole. Have you read Dopamine Nation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I spoke to her. Yeah, yeah. me too. I spoke yeah. to her as well. Yeah. yeah, it was all about, and it's very true though, right? Yeah. Like I, I mean, I think I belong back in the '90s or the 2000s. I think that's like was that was my era. I'm very, I'm very unhappy with how things have like evolved in that way. And I say it's very much like I call it like coddle culture in a lot of ways, right? Yeah. People want to do the bare minimum, yeah. and people are coddling them, and 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 it's okay. Like this whole like I'm enough philosophy that's very popular, you know, it doesn't work for me, right? No, I, I should have lived in the 1700s or the 1800s. <laughs> I, um, I would have loved it um, back then. As a matter of fact, I'm most attracted to places in movies when um, it's like cold and like Shrek's hut would be a place where I'd really? want to live. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I really am. I'm like, oh man, that would, looks awesome. You know, they're heating that the cabin with a, a wood and, um, but like, yeah. where does it come from? Because I know you've done like 50 ultra, was it 50 races or yeah. 50 ultra marathons? And, yeah. but like before you even created Spartan, right? Yeah. Were you even like, what were you doing as like a, were you, a, did you jog every day? Like what, how did you kind of like inch your way into this like crazy, super crazy, endurance crazy. So, so um, adventure stuff? So a couple of things. So the neighborhood I grew up in, if you saw the movie Goodfellas, I grew up ground zero for Goodfellas, literally across the street from the family. And everybody in the neighborhood was either, either they owned a pizza place, um, they owned some business, a trucking company, a tow truck company, um, a cement yard. A waste masonry, management. Wa wa waste management, all true, exactly true. Um, and so you were either hustling or stealing, like something was going on. Yeah. Like, like if you walked into a friend's house, it was highly likely that the mom had a CB radio in the kitchen while she was making sauce and was running the tow truck business. Out. Like that's like everybody was just working, really? it was integrated in their lives. And so um, Danny, Danny lived in his Chinese restaurant with his Chinese, you know what yeah. I mean? Like everybody was just working. Mom. So that was my, that was my, my, my dad was wound up and all that. He had a trucking company and, um, mom finds yoga, meditation, health food, but she take it, takes it to an extreme level. And she's like meditating for 30 days straight while fasting. She's running 10 miles a day. Her guru sets up a race in Queens, New York. That's a 3,100 mile, 3, mile run around a one mile loop that eight people participate in each year to show everybody what the human brain Wow. is possible, you know, capable of. So, um, so anyway, I'm seeing all that go down. I'm seeing guys go to jail for 25 years. Again, that's, that's another endurance feat. 100%, right? yes. <laughs> right? So, so whether it was running a business, whether it was going to jail, whether it was the risk of being killed, whether it was meditating, running 3,100 miles, it's no surprise that, that, um, I mean, in some ways, when you think about like um, a triathlon or an ultra run, it's like it's a catered training day. Every 10 miles, there's going to be food. We're out here and like, <laughs> this is unbelievable compared to like my cousin going away for 25 years. You know what I mean? So true. But you don't see like you didn't you never saw like Tony Soprano getting into this stuff or any other good fella type of guy. You know well, what I mean? One of the things that bugged me again, because I had I had. Think about it. I had both sides. I had my mom who's health and right, wellness had, nut. And, and then I had my dad. One of the things that bugged me was I would look at these very successful men, whether they were heads of organized crime families or owned businesses. And somehow uh, what ran parallel to them becoming successful was them getting fat and smoking cigars yeah. and drinking. Right. And 
I, I just remember playing a tape in my head saying, I don't understand why you wouldn't want to be really, really fit. And one of the bosses uh, who became my customer, because we didn't talk about my, my swimming pool business, we'll talk about in a minute, was the head of the Luc Lucchese crime family, um, little Vic, uh, Vic Amuso. And I became, I became friends with him because he was a fitness nut. So not only was he the boss, not only did he have the biggest house in the neighborhood, but he was a fitness nut. So every, every time we saw each other, right? Like we had something to talk about. Like, like how, you know, what you, what would you do for a workout today? What'd you do for a workout today? So you were working out already because of your mother's influence. Because of my mother's influence. What were you and doing though? What was the kind of workout you were doing back I, then? I found um, weight training. Oh, so you're weight training? I, was, I found weight training, but I did it in a different way. And I don't know why I came up with this. I came up with something called a prison workout. Cause the only guy, the only kids that wanted to do it with me were kids that got out of prison. And it was um, 120 sets um, in one hour. So we had to do every body part, which was not typical back then. <laughs> typical back then was, oh, we're just gonna do uh, back and legs yeah, today. Yeah, and we're yeah. right. Splits. And, yeah, and I couldn't get my head around that because I would say to myself, I don't, I don't really understand. Like if we saw an animal uh, 300 years ago and we were hungry, would we say, oh, we can't go chase that deer today because we did legs yesterday? <laughs> like, I don't understand. <laughs> Right, so, so why wouldn't we just do everything and get it done and be efficient and also incorporate like endurance in it. So for one hour, we would do 120 sets. Every set had 25 reps. It was fucking insane. Like every time I went to the gym, I would have PTSD because it was so hard. What were do. you doing? What were the sets of what? Give so me an we would example. Start, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll walk you through it. So it would start out on the squat rack and again, this is like late 80s. So, so I apologize if it's not cool and hip to anybody listening or watching. By the watching, way, it's but. very hip and, that, and things always cycle back, right? Yeah. It kind of seems very like, um, like hit training or like even CrossFit-ish. It, yeah, it's CrossFit-ish before CrossFit yeah. and, and hit before hit. And, um, and so it would start out on the squat rack and we would do 25 reps and uh, I would have a plate on each side. So it'd be 135 pounds. I'd knock out 25 reps and you'd have to run to the next thing. There was no like, oh, I'm going to rest for a second. Yeah, yeah. And I ran right over to leg extensions, leg curls, 25 reps, 25 reps, calf races, 25 reps. All right. And, and then that would be four rounds. So um, oh. insane, right? Then yeah. from legs, we would go to shoulders. And so it would be a, a military press, 25 reps. It would be side uh, lateral raises, front raises, rear delt raises, um, 25, 25, yeah. four rounds. From there, we would go to the, um, the, the pull-up machine that, that gives you assistance, that has the, you know, yes, the little- Yes, of course, could, yeah. And so it'd be four rounds, you'd do 25, and then you'd need assistance, 25, and then you'd need more assistance and Chin -ups more- Chin-ups or pull-ups? Pull-ups. Okay, um, the hard ones. The hard ones. Yeah. From there, we would go to chest, we would do dumbbell, Bench press, incline, dumbbell bench press, decline, dumbbell push-ups, four rounds, 25, 25 reps each one. From there, we would go uh, to biceps. We would knock out preacher curl or stand-up curls, preacher curls, chin-ups, you know, uh, chin um, and then dumbbell hammer curls, 25 reps, four rounds, and then, um, and then triceps. And, um, every day? No, or like every five? other day. Oh, okay. Every other day. That's crazy. It was crazy. It was crazy. And there was only one kid, I forget his last name, John, who had just got out of prison, was the only one that would do this with me. And, you, and you're the one who kind of created and thought of this whole thing. I created it. I had an hour. I was running a business. That I don't have time. It gets me in incredible shape. It was the best I ever felt. It was unbelievable. That's amazing. Yeah. Why don't you do that anymore? It's fucking hard. Yeah, it <laughs> is really, hard. It's it's really hard. It sounds super hard. Yeah. But like, did, did, when did you stop that routine? <sighs> So that went, I probably went into the night, probably to the mid nineties when I found adventure racing. Then I found these crazy races and, and my, my training changed to like, I would do um, a lot of stairs. I found, I found a backpack and a weight vest and I found a stairwell and I fell in love with a stairwell and a backpack. And that was the end and of that, the, and, the weight that became, stuff. That became the end of that. And I lived in the stairwell. How much were you doing in the stairwell? I mean, I, it would be, um, it would be 35 flights, five rounds, so a couple, of, a couple of hundred flights. I'd spend an hour in the stairwell in the morning. I'd come back in the afternoon. I'd have 30 or 40 pounds on my back. Not bored at all? No, I'd put music in my ears. And it, th those were always escapes because I'm such a workaholic, like building a business or whatever I'm always doing, that um, those are moments of meditation. 
Right. It's like, I was going to say, it's your form, my form of meditation. Cause yeah. I can't sit still. Can you? I can't sit still. Right. So that's like, for me, I say running anything that's like cardio or endurance. Yeah. Like that's when you can actually like think about everything. Think. Yeah. yeah. Get back to water, food and shelter. Exactly. No, exactly. It's true. Yeah. But yeah. why don't, so then why were you doing a stairwell? Couldn't you find like stairs outside or just cause. You know, there was something about, um, the lack of oxygen in there oh, was yeah. good, was good. And, um, and I just didn't, ha again, I was always trying to fit things in like like the woman I described on the CB radio making sauce. Yeah. I was just, my I, I believe in work-life integration. So it was like roll out of bed, right into the stairwell, knock that out, get to work before eight. You know, I just, I just had to fit it all in. Okay, so I, we like, we, we kind of jumped somewhere, but I wanted you to finish what about your kids because I think it's fascinating. Yeah. You said that you, that you would wake them up at 5.30 in the morning, yeah. right? Still. Even at three, still. still. Yeah. Well, now they're what? They're 12, you said? They're 14? Nine, uh, nine, 13, 14, 16. 16, okay. So what happens? You wake them up and what do you do? You didn't tell us what you do. Work, workout. So well, I- Well, no, it's I, a workout. It's not so, that 120 so, um, prisoner workout. Kung Fu master for four years and then. So what, that guy lived with you for four years and what, what did he do with them? He woke, was, up, he it woke was up with them? It was almost like, um, I don't know gymnastics, but it would have been like mat gymnastics almost. Okay. Um, tumbling, okay. single leg squats was a thing I remember him doing in the barn That's with them. That's so hard. Um, and the uh, three-year-olds doing this? They were doing it. It was unbelievable. Grabbing their feet, putting it over there. I could probably find some old videos. You could, you could, you could. I, I got to get you old videos. You got to put it. You'd be un. It's unbelievable what these kids were doing. And um, they would hang from a pull-up bar and they would do uh, leg raises, perfect, like 50 in a row. It was unbelievable. So that went on, which I would highly recommend. Anybody listening to this that has children, if you, you have to put your kids, in my opinion, three years old, to like seven or eight, they should all ever always be in gymnastics. Get them in gymnastics. Forget about any other sport. And then seven or eight to like eleven or twelve, put them in every sport. They should swim. They would, and then eleven or twelve, pick your sport. That's what I. That's what I would do based on what I just went through. That's a great. That's actually a great advice, and I I agree. I'm trying to get them my, my nine year old to yeah. try as many things as possible. Do them all. Do everything to see what he likes. Exactly. So then they wake up. So how long was this Kung Fu master working with them in the so morning? So they went seven days a week. They went twice a day. And then- um, Twice a day? Twice a day. They were two long, days. An hour at a time? It was time? an hour in the morning, an hour at night. Okay. And, and, um, and then I found, uh, I was at dinner with some Wall Street buddies and I was pounding my chest on what a cool dad I was because <laughs> I got a Kung Fu master. And um, my friend put me in my place. And he said, you know, I grew up next door to uh, an ex Green Beret wrestler. And I didn't know anything about wrestling. And he said, um, his two children, his two boys, who were my friends, my friend is telling me, uh, in Seattle, would uh, go down the basement every night uh, for an hour and a half and wrestle in the dark blindfolded because their dad believed, the Green Beret believed that if they could you know, master wrestling blindfolded, they would crush it um, in a real life in real match life. When, when the lights are on. So this went on for a decade in the basement to the point where people were calling social services and it was- No way, are yeah, you serious? True story. So I'm listening, I'm leaning in, I'm listening, right? <laughs> and, um, and he's like, the story's crazy. He goes, the kids become really high level wrestlers and one of them becomes a coach at Stanford University. And while he's a coach at Stanford University, he institutes a new policy where he's bringing neighborhood wrestlers in to mix it up with his Stanford wrestlers to give them different competition, which now that I know wrestling, a lot of places do that. You gotta have lots of bodies in the room to, to get people used to different, different types of wrestling. So, um, so anyway, this goes on for a while. And one of those neighborhood kids in the Stanford wrestling room says to the coach, who was one of the two brothers who grew up in the basement, um, coach, I got nowhere to sleep tonight. I got locked out of my apartment. Could I sleep on the mat? Coach says, don't be ridiculous. Um, stay in my apartment, stay on the couch. I'm going out with my buddies, just sleep on the couch. He comes home, coach comes home, goes into his bedroom, he's sleeping. Guy gets up off the couch, opens the door to, um, his name's Jay Jackson, opens the door to his room, he's got a gun. Random act of violence, gonna kill the coach. He um, strips the coach down to his underwear, zip ties his hands behind his back to the chair, zip ties his legs to the chair, pillowcase over his head, presses the revolver to his head, 
has tickets to like somewhere in Latin America they found later. Um, it's going to literally just kill the coach. Coach says, um, could you shut the lights before you pull the trigger? Trained in the basement for 10 years in the dark. Shuts the lights. Coach proceeds to disarm the perpetrator. Uh, I'm getting chills. I've told the story 5,000 times. Uh, disarm the perpetrator. Somehow pin him while tied to a chair. Um, calls 911 from behind his back. Stanford police break the door down, find a scene from Pulp Fiction, blood, a guy, a phone, uh, like tied to a chair. Um, I hear this story at this dinner. I jump on a plane with my wife. We come out to California. I got to meet this guy. My kids became wrestlers. I got rid of the Kung Fu master. That was the end of, of Kung Fu. Are you serious? Yeah. That's an amazing story. Unbelievable story. Yeah, it's in my, it's in my, it's in one of the books that you didn't read or didn't even know about. <laughs> Normally I read every book that's so yeah, funny. Yeah, and the one person yeah, I really yeah, wanted to have on a podcast. Three fucking books I yeah. wrote. She didn't read. She, I read she doesn't even know I have a book. I, I, no, no, I didn't know you had, <laughs> let's just clarify. I did not realize you had a parenting book until last week, but huh. I knew about the other books, Spartan huh. Up. Yeah. And the other one is Spartan Fit. There's Spartan, Spartan Fit. Fit. You have yeah. more than three books. Yeah, Ten Rules of Resilience. Ten, that's that one. I know. That, I well, got that. Well, that's the one. That's the parenting book. Ten Rules. Of oh, Resilience. that is. Yeah. Oh, I I read it online. Okay, was it good? It was I mean, really good. Okay. Good. In fact, I have a lot of questions from like I thought that was really really good. And I, I by the way, I wanted to be a little more forward in the title that it's a parenting book, but the but publisher, which is one of the top publishers in the world. Didn't want, didn't want, they're all afraid of me. Everybody's afraid of me and, and the way I want to speak or the things I want to say. I know, but why? I don't get it. Don't like get you're it so either. motivating. I'm so normal. You're like, so you, it, the funny thing is you are normal. I that know. is the weird thing. I like know. you seem like you're very, obviously you're aggressive in your lifestyle, CNBC but you're not. CNBC was like out of their mind filming with me. If you don't get them out of the cold water now, we're canceling the show. I'm like, calm down, relax. Really? I've been doing this for a long time. I know they're not going to die. And did anyone die? No. See? I know. See, so, but like to me, that would make great TV. You'd think that they would want that or they didn't want to be liable. They don't want to so. be liable. There's did, a lot of, there's a, you know, there's a lot of people in the world, you know, now there's lawyers involved, you know, you know the whole thing. Totally, deal. yeah. But where That's were we? Hollywood. Oh, That's Hollywood. Oh, yeah. That's Hollywood. That's Hollywood. Yeah. So, so, um, no, so, anyway, so the kids became wrestlers. Once they became wrestlers, um, my wife was a high level soccer player, so she, the girls weren't gonna wrestle, so they picked up soccer. I had to switch. How many girls? Two girls, oh, two, two boys. Two, okay. I had to come up with a methodology and a workout program that I could somehow execute myself every day now that I no longer have the Kung Fu master. What could I do that I could actually get these kids to do? Yeah. That would be good for their whole body. So I created 12 animal movements that I could name animals we could have some That's fun with one, it yep. and I had, I could do it anywhere we lived in the world, any, any apartment outside, anywhere. We're just going to do it every day. As long as they did their 10 animal movements, at least I got that done. Whatever we got on top of that was a bonus. So, you know, there was a bear crawl, yeah. right? Um, there was something we called a scorpion where you'd bend over backwards actually, and then walk like a, I know. Like a you know, yeah. the deal. We would do rabbit jumps and duck walks and, and it was just like every friggin' day. That's what we did. How long was it each movement? The funny thing is, um, it depended on the room we had or the outside. Yeah. Like, um, if we were on the farm, I'd make them go like a quarter mile. Oh my <laughs> like it was crazy, God. right? Yes. But but um, but consistency, we had to do it every day. And um, now, now that they're in their sports, now they don't have to do that anymore. Now they train the way, however their team is What did the trained. girls do though? They play soccer. They play so, soccer yeah, with yeah, your wife, okay. So they're on. And so your wife is okay with all this crazy training and schedule? you know my wife my wife um, definitely thinks I'm nuts um, but I think I've I've somehow gotten her to submit um, on all this just because I'm relentless with it and I think I think now uh, that my oldest is getting recruited to these colleges I think she sees now like oh my god he's crazy but it was it actually, it actually does works. something yeah. did any does any do, does one particular kid or any of the kids at any given point ever rebel have they ever rebelled and been like screw you dad I'm not doing this or you know my my 16 year old Sunday morning there was a non required just Sunday they passed I came back from the middle east I landed up I was in my house for 24 hours and then I came here my 16 year old was up till 
now that he's being recruited by the colleges, he was up Saturday night till 2 a.m. doing homework. He's got to get straight A. He's got to take his oh, AP yeah. classes, right? He's got to nail that. And um, Sunday morning, they were doing a 9 a.m. workout, wrestlers, non-required, not, they didn't have to go. Right, right. And um, he's like, Dad, I got to sleep. And I had to fight my own instinct was grabbing his feet, pulling him out of his bed, which I've been doing for whatever, 13 years. Do you actually do that? Like, like basically Oh, I pull them right out Because they don't want to do it. Every day, just pull them out of their bed. And um, <laughs> I pull everybody out of I put, put, turn music on, lights on. I wake the whole ass up every morning. At 5, 5 a.m.? It depends on, you know, it could be 5.30, 5.40. It depends on what I have going on. With Even the, the girls still? Oh, rip the girls right out of bed. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. And so, um, so anyway, I had to fight my own instinct. And I said, you know what? Let him sleep. He was up last night. He's doing, you know, so now I'm... Um, we're getting to the point with him because he's 16 years old yeah. that um, now he's got, now he's got to own it. It's, right. It's but he's it. already like, you like, you feel like he's a proven track. Right? He's giving you the proof. He knows the, like the, the deal. The yeah, he sees it. Yeah. But does anybody, how about the other three? Do, well, now the younger brother, yeah. now he's stepped. Now he's like, oh my God, I see now what's happening to my older brother. I, I got game on. I got to really, I gotta yeah. Like this happened in the last three weeks. Are are any of them more just naturally, innately more like you? Like who would, that you feel is like, yeah, you know what? Well, you know, what's interesting is um, there's little components of me in each one of them. Really? But no, nobody has, um, thank God for them, nobody has the whole Joe. Right, right. No, right, right, and, right. And they all have, they definitely all have my wife who's much nicer than I am, much more cuddly. And um, is she the opposite of you in that? Like, is she the, like super the, like? Is she like a B personality? Like, she was very B? high level at her. She was captain of her team in soccer. Went final four. Oh wow. Penn State, high, very high level, but not because she trained every day. I shouldn't say that again. She trained at like kicking the ball and juggling the ball. As far as working out, that was not. Not her. her she was just talented, very talented, and very likable, and right. and um, unlike me. <laughs> and so when I look at the kids, my little daughter, and we should talk, we got to talk about this. My little daughter is zipping around on her little scooter. She wanted yeah. a scooter. She got this pink scooter. And I was like, oh, you know what? I, I used to have dirt bikes. Like she's riding those. Like I was riding dirt bikes. You know what I mean? She's right. got that. And so there's each one of them has a little piece of my personality. But the thing I would warn everybody against that's, that's listening is um, when I reflect back on the mistakes I might have made, I think one thing we all do is our first child, we overparent them. Mm -hmm. And our last child, I underparent. And when I look at the underparenting of our last child, she's like a machine. She's like, she's got to fend for herself. She's got to figure it out on her own. And, um, and even at 16 years old and nine years old, I'm still overparenting the 16 and underparenting the nine. Isn't that so true? I feel yeah. that way with my two also. Like, because at what you're first, you over, like, you just like are, you kind of like are over them. Like, it's like, it's like a they're brand new. They're all the new, pictures. Yeah, you do like a, Don't eat that dirt off the ground. The fourth one, you know, like. Whatever, exactly. I don't even know where she is. A hundred percent. I feel right. that with two kids, you're like, right. and, but you're right. They become more scrappy that way. Yeah. It does, it's a hundred percent true. So then, okay, so that's your kid situation. Yeah. Um, now, can we get back into like, let's go to, okay, so now we can kind of rewind or fast forward back to where you're talking about going up and down the, what do you call it? The stairway. The stairwell. So, then, so how did that turn into, I'm going to, I'm going to create Spartan. So how did that go to that? So that was probably mid nineties and, um, the elevator was broken in our building and I needed a way to get up. To, so I took the stairs and I met a guy that was on the cover of men's health in the stairwell. Oh, yeah, and, right. um, and I had the background from my mom and all the crazy running and all that. So it was already woven into my brain somewhere, but I ran into this guy and he was carrying dumbbells up and down the stairs and, in that journey, uh, and start, I started working out with him, meeting him in the stairwell. He taught so me- So he was also in the stairwell, with, but you already were in the stairwell doing your I thing. I met him in the stairwell, and that's what started my journey right. in the stairwell. But that's what I'm saying, you, got, you were already doing that stairwell workout. No, I was, I was walking the stairs because oh, the elevator was broken. I met him, and, then and that's started what started okay. the stairwell thing. And then, um, and then he, in, in, in one of our workouts, talked to me about adventure racing, which I didn't know what that was. Okay. And, um, and I went and did one with him and I fell in love with it. It was just so unbelievable. It was like, it was like being Lewis and Clark. It was like, I went back to the right. 1700s, you know, it was awesome. And so the crazier the race was. Um, what the kind more of races were they back then? So it might, it might have been um, the Iditarod, uh, which was a race across Alaska, typically done with dogs on a dog sled we did by foot. Uh -huh. 
It was uh, the raid. Um, what like, would you do? What would be like a race that you oh, would do? Oh, it would be typically 350 to 500 miles long. It would be um, self-supported, so you're carrying your stuff with you. Every 70 or so miles, there's probably a checkpoint somewhere to check in and you know make sure everybody's alive. And um, <laughs> and we're going we're going up and down mountains and across a country, uh, New Finland, Switzerland, um, Fiji. How long um, would be each race about? Could be anywhere from five to 15 days long. And, um, and you're losing a ton of weight and you're getting sick probably. And you're somehow really getting to meet yourself and find out what you're made of. And in some of them, it's 30 below zero and your eyelashes are frozen shut. And you're like, I want to die. And you, you know, you can't take another step, but you, you push through. So I fell in love with that. And I had a lot of time, as you can imagine, if I did, if I did 20 of those events huh. and each event on average was 10 days, that's 200 days of thinking where I'm alone, right? And just thinking. And I thought, boy, this would be like an unbelievable business. I saw my, my mom change so many lives, getting people into yoga and meditation and eating healthy. Like, could I change lives um, by putting on races like this and like institutionalizing this? Because I was finding these one-off races in the middle of nowhere. Could I do it? in a big way. Were you doing it with this other guy, this men's health model? No, he, he his limit was three hours. And so I, I wanted to go, cause there were three hour distances as well back then. And so after I had done one of those, I said, what's, what's next? And he said, well, 24 hours, but you gotta be, I, sign me up, I wanna do 24 hours. And then I did 24 hours, I was like, what's, what's, I need harder, what, what's crazier than this? <laughs> and I, well, the Iditarod is like, sign me up, I'm doing the Iditarod. Is this still around? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So is he still around or is no? It, I did a rod. Uh, or oh yeah, whatever. I did a rod. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah you've, you've, you don't remember, but you've seen people have seen movies of the I did a rod rate. You know the dog. They typically, you know, they they get on a sled and the dogs are pulling them through Alaska in the middle of winter. But this was without the dogs. This was by foot. By foot. Yeah, I probably have seen it. You've but seen now, it. But now, like Spartan, like that's like much more embedded into people's like well, psyche. So, so I'm doing these races forever, and then and I'm never got hurt though. Never got hurt, knock on wood. Yeah, I mean. And, and I would attribute, I did a lot of yoga. One of one of the things that was woven into all my training was was stretching and yoga, thanks to mom. And um, the other thing is I never really ran fast. Like I, I think when I think about my wife who had knee injuries or any athlete yeah. that has injuries, it's that fast running. I totally agree with that. Everything I did was slow. You know, right. it was long, long distances, but slow. And um. And then I always took care of myself. And then- What did you do for recovery back then? I didn't really believe in recovery. You know, I don't, I don't really, I did a lot of cold water therapy. I, I, back I did, then even? Even back then, I got into cold water. I got into cold showers in the um, 80s. I got into cold showers. And yeah. it, was, it was really because from the neighborhood, it was kind of inevitable that you were going to jail because that was like how you made your bones or whatever. And so like, you know, could I carry rocks around the neighborhood? Could I take a cold shower? Could I like, cause if I gotta go, right? If you that's- You gotta do those things, You yeah. gotta be able to do those, right? So- So you were actually prepping and training for just in case you went to jail. It's crazy, isn't that crazy? Yeah. So, so- But um, were you like, were you doing anything like criminal-like? Were you like dishonest? No, were I mean, you stealing there were, money for, with no, this guy? No, there were, there were some stupid things as a kid that you, you, it really is unbelievable that we've all been so close to doing something that right. would have changed the trajectory of our lives, but, but- um. Thankfully, between my mom, my dad, uh, I always took a liking and asked for opinions from older people. Like, thankfully, and the organized crime thing faded away a bit right at the time where I would have done something oh. stupid. So that was, they all went to jail. Even so the Vince, the ma he, main guy? The main guy. Went um, to jail? Yeah, little Vic. Little Vic, um, sorry. Is still in jail now. He's been in jail since 1992. Really? Every, I would say every three months I have a dream about him. He's coming out soon. Amazing. How old will um, he be when he gets like- 80s. Yeah. Wow. Is that crazy? That is so crazy. And that you never got like, you never got wrapped up in any of that stuff though. They were, they were, um, they were really good about finding kids that worked. I, I worked hard. I would have been an earner. Yeah. So had that thing all, had that structure all stayed in place. Um, I would have had 
an opportunity, you know, and, and the question is, would I have been stupid enough to take that opportunity? Right. Um, but, but then it went away. And at the same time, like we didn't talk about it. So I'm in Ithaca, New York now, because my parents get divorced. My mother's not being accepted in the neighborhood. Right. Right. Or, was she Italian too? Though? She was Italian. Okay. So, um, so she's like, we're moving to Ithaca, New York. Ithaca, New York was very hippie-ish. Uh, right. There's colleges there, much more open-minded to yoga, meditation, health food, being a vegan. And um, Even back then. Even, well, because of colleges, the professors. But right? vegan? Even, even back then? Even yeah. back then. Yeah, this stuff's been around. I mean, we forever. think it's all new, but it's been, been around forever. So, so anyway, I'm graduating high school. I want to get back to the neighborhood. I want to be with the tough guys. I've got a business I'm running there. I'm cleaning swimming pools for all these guys. And um, my friend says to me, hey... Um, why don't we go to Cornell? So I said, how the hell are we going to go to Cornell? Like my SAT scores suck. We didn't, I didn't even study. He's like, my dad's, um, a professor. He'll get us in. So I said, okay, you got a guy and we'll go, we'll go to Cornell. <laughs> I got so, a guy. Yeah, yeah. So we both do, uh, get our suits on. We do interviews. We're very late in the process. We're graduating high school in like three or four months. And, um, my dad's so proud that I, my mom and dad are so proud. I got an interview at Cornell. I didn't even do anything yet, right? <laughs> I got an interview. I have my son's interviewing at Cornell. So it's I a do, big deal, by the way. Cornell's uh, still like, it's a very, very, yeah. very popular and very So big I do, deal. I do the interview and um, neither of us get accepted. And um, no wonder. And he says, hang on, but my dad said, if we go in and take uh, extramural classes and prove that we could handle the workload, in the first semester, uh, we could reapply and maybe get in. So I said, okay, if we're going to do that, I'll go to St. John's during the summer while I'm running my business in Queens. I'll take a couple of classes. I'll get tuned up on how to study. And, um, and he's like, fuck that. He goes, uh, why wouldn't we party all summer? He goes, I'm going to go to Vegas, party, and then we'll buckle down in September. So we right there, I learned about delayed gratification. I, I went to Queens. I went to St. John's. I actually loved it. While I was running my business, we met back at, on campus in September. We both took three classes each. I worked my ass off. I got two A's and a B, which was like I, I was working for NASA, like to, <laughs> to land two, two A's and a B. And um, reapplied and didn't get accepted. So a bit dejected, but I'm the kind of person that gets more motivated. when. So then I did it again. Uh, he diverted. He went to Vegas. He went to UNLV. And um, di I applied again, didn't get accepted. They did it a third time, applied again. Now I'm falling behind with credits because I can't take as many credits as the kids right. that are matriculated. So by the fourth semester, I was kind of like, you know what? They broke me. I'm out. Um, told my dad. I don't know if I told you this story last time we talked, but told my dad I'm coming back to New York. My mom got upset because mothers never want to lose their kids, right? Right. So she's like, go meet this woman, Anita Racine. Uh, I teach her yoga. I don't know if she could help or not. Uh, Professor Anita sits me down. She's like, I'm looking at your transcript, not your transcripts, your, the records we have. And um, she's like, do you like textiles? I didn't really know what a textile was. She's like, because I run the textile department in the School of Human Ecology within Cornell that has 92 women and we're looking for diversity. We need more men. I was like, I love textiles. <laughs> right? Kidding me? <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I, I, um, she accepted me and I studied uh, women's hemlines for the remainder of my, my time at Cornell, graduated. So what's um, your degree in text in, in like well it's a bachelor of science anyway in fashion well there was a fashion component but um most of it was business the business of textiles a little bit of science where we studied chemistry and stuff right to see how fabrics are made and how threads you know uh, are made it was pretty it's pretty awesome and still to this day i can tell you the uh, era of any movie based on women's hemlines because I studied so much the, of it. The juxtaposition between that and your life is just, Crazy. it's like, just, it's, it's like not surprising actually. Like it, in it's real, awesome. it's amazing, but it's like, I'm not surprised to hear this. It's crazy. Your whole life has been like kind of crazy cuckoo, right? Cuckoo. So, so, um, so basically you have a degree, you have a degree from Cornell. I have a degree from Cornell. I got my four years done, which was again, monumental. And then, um, and then I met a guy while I was there. Who, You're always meeting a guy. <laughs> I always meet people. I talk to everybody. And um, he guided me to go to Wall Street. And so, um, so when you asked the question earlier, like, you know, how did you not get mixed up in all that? Yeah. 
at the same time, that was 1990 when I graduated. Most of the guys went to jail early 90s. Um, at the same time that was going down, I was getting pushed to Wall Street. So, um, so I ended up finding a job on Wall Street. I ended up selling my business to the Polish kids who had worked right. for me. Wow. Um, they still run the business today. They've done incredibly well. They still have the business? They still have the business today. And I- um, You told me you sold it for like 500,000. 500,000, yeah. I stay in touch with them. And, um, and I went to Wall Street. I had a, a great run on Wall Street. That's where I met the guy in the stairwell and, and got into adventure racing. And it was a way for me also on Wall Street to escape reality and go like be in Alaska or be in- I was gonna say, but you just kind of answered the question, are you a loner? Just because when you spend that much time alone in your thoughts, when you're doing all these adventure races yeah. and you're like in, for days on end, you're just having to think on your own. You would think that people who gravitate to that are people who like to be by themselves, but you're a very friendly person. I'm friendly, but I, but I, but if you give, given the choice, like when my, my wife is the opposite and she loves old people over and big dinner parties and this and that. And I'm like by eight 30 at night, I'm turning the lights off, picking up people's plates and trying to get them out of the house. <laughs> like I'm not, I'm not really interested. Right. Um, that said, I like meeting you and talking to you. And then I'm like, I'm going to turn you off and not text you anymore. I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. But, but I am, I would prefer to be in that hut on the mountain and just chopping wood for right. me. I would prefer that. So yeah. if you had your druthers, so like basically, like, I guess your wife's a good, like, do you think opposites do attract them? Because if she's, and not just with you guys, but I, I, I always think about this anyway. Like, is it good when one person's more introverted and the other one's more extroverted? Like, what do you think about opposites? I think, I think a couple of things. Like, number one, I had an amazing childhood in that I, I cleaned 700 swimming pools, 700 different houses I got to peer, right. you know, look into and see which mm. families worked, who got divorced, who didn't, who went to jail, who didn't, which kids were successful, which weren't. And so I got to, to, to think a lot about what are things I want to apply to my life. And so um, most people were getting divorced within those 700 homes. And so it is amazing that um, I've been able to stay together for 20 years with my wife. And I think part of it is I travel a lot, right? So you get that little break, whether it's five days, 10 days, whatever, I think that's great. And then two is I think the fact that we are opposite so that, and then somebody's gotta, somebody's gotta bend. Like I'm a pretty strong personality. Right. And so the fact that she bends and allows me to be difficult is, is awesome. Um, your next guest is here. Yeah, do I, I have, do so. I get ejected? Might... Do I get ejected at this point? Dude, <laughs> yes. She, for you, for those that don't know it, there's literally a thing under my seat. You're just going to see me disappear. <laughs> <laughs> you think it's important to have someone who can bend. You're not a bender. Okay. So that means you think opposites do attract. I think so. I think, um, yeah, I think it would be really, if, if, if my wife was similar to me, we would have never lasted. Yeah. No way. We're, we're just, it would be, we'd lock horns and it would, right? It would it'd just be too much of the same. Too much. Um, she's so um, malleable. Right. In that, in, 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 like, yeah. So, like, but like at the same time, if you like to, run and do activities and someone else likes to like sit at home and watch Netflix. It's not going to be, it's I mean, not going to work I mean, either. That, I mean, that's a tough one. Look, I'm pretty intense. You guys have heard me. Like I want to yes. work out every day. I want to be consistent. She's not like that. That doesn't mean she's not going to work out, but, but for her, the workout is much more interesting if it's a social thing right. and she's with people and I don't need anybody. Right. I don't want anybody. Like if you're with me, great. If you're not, I don't, I could care less. What kind of workout do you do today? Like what's your workout now? So I get on, I get on kicks and, um, in this wrestling room, I, we, I think we talked about it the last time we spoke, I moved to Florida recently because I couldn't get my team to come back in the office in Boston. No, you didn't tell me that. Um, I want to actually, I want to get to all the Spartan stuff in your business. We haven't even talked about that yet. So our business was located in, is located in Boston. And, um, for many years and, and when- Where's your farm? I thought you had a farm. Farm is in Vermont, three hours from the Boston office. Oh, uh, okay. It started in Vermont. It mo it became an official office in Boston, three hours away. And then um, during the pandemic, no one came in the office, obviously. And right. It was driving me a little nuts, except for my assistant, Susan, who you spoke to, mm. who religiously was there every friggin' day. Really? She's a maniac and um, she's awesome. I, I hold up on the farm with a, a bunch of staff 
and we just had cameras going like this because I was doing live workouts every day to stay in touch with our community. My little daughter, the maniac, she was running a live workout every day. She was getting really? millions of views. She's a she's a beast. And the, um, no, how, the nine year old or the other the nine year old who was seven or something. She's unbelievable. She was doing she workouts got, live. Live. She's got the personality. She talks into the camera. She's unbelievable. What kind of workouts was she doing? Like workouts, like stuff. Are like, you I, serious? I, we, we should we should edit we should edit something in here. You'll love it. So so um so, so I'm on the farm doing that. Susan, my assistant's coming in to do up. Nobody else is coming in. Pandemic is coming to a conclusion. And I'm trying to get people back in the office, but who moved to Maine? Who went to Minnesota? Mm -hmm. And um, I'm losing my mind. I can't get anybody back in the office. So I said, where could I move and kind of reinvigorate a culture and, and people that want to come in because I, I'm old fashioned. I want people in an office. And so I found this place in Florida. And um, where in Florida? Lake Nona and Winter Park. So um, it's, it's Orlando, uh, outside, right outside of Orlando, not a place you and I would ever pick in the world to move to. So you live in Orlando live now? I live in Orlando now. Yeah. I mean, we kept the farm. We'll go up to the farm uh, two, three times a wow. year. But, um, but we're in Orlando. We found the greatest school in the world, literally the greatest school in the world. It's called Lake Highland Prep. Uh, it's got one of the best wrestling programs in the country. And wow. it, I, we got an apartment five minutes from the wrestling room so that I could just walk out of my house with the kids, go into the wrestling room and they have Airdyne bikes. And yeah. I and I watch them wrestle and I knock out 300 calories and it's hot as can be in this room. You do the bike while you're watching these guys. I, yeah. Wow. And, and that, so that's been my, that's been my thing. Um, during the summer, I got on a little Murph kick. I did, um, I did 50 days in a row of Murph. Um, Tell that, people what that is. So Murph is um, a 300, um, 300 squats, uh, 200 push-ups, 100 pull-ups, and a two-mile run. And so um, early June, I got on a kick of doing Murph every day because there was a guy I met in Florida who was doing it every day during the pandemic. It pissed me off. So then I said, I'm going to do it every day. Um, and I, I planned on doing it for the whole year. But then with this traveling, it, just, it got screwed up. So I got, I got to get back on it. So would you, um, today, what was your workout? Today I did um, 30 minutes on an air dine. Um, again? Again. And then I did 100 pull-ups, 100 squats, 100 push-ups. Where'd you do and, it? In the uh, Sofitel Hotel. No, and but did they have an air dine there? They did. They had a, well, a similar to an air dine. They had, um, they had a machine that looked like, that was close. So If they didn't have it, what would you have done? The treadmill? A treadmill. Yeah. And then you still do your, say again, the hundred push-ups. I did, I did a hundred, I didn't do the whole thing. I did a hundred pull-ups, a hundred push-ups, a hundred squats and 200 leg raises, hanging leg raises. You must yeah. be like, you're so fit. Like that's crazy. You know what, you know what's funny about that, that statement is when I was doing it, I was like, I'm so soft because my workouts were usually so crazy I know, I know. that I was like, this is such a soft workout. And I was beating myself up. So it's funny you said that. It's all relative, right? Yeah. To what, yeah. I do that to myself all the time, by the way. So then, okay. So then basically, when, once you finish your workout, what other- Ice cold shower. No, but wait, wait, wait. What other activities are you doing movement-wise during the day? Well, Is I'm, that always, it? I'm always gonna take stairs. I'll, I'll typically hit a second workout if if my life allows it, right? If I, um, right. If I come back from work, the kids are wrestling again, I'll go into the wrestling room. Um, and I'll typically hit a second workout. But, you know, again, the last seven, eight days, I've been traveling all over the world, so it hasn't, it hasn't so, happened. But you still do the one workout? No. Nope. I right. always get that workout done. So do you ever skip a day? No. Ever? No. Okay. And then you're saying you do a cold shower. Yeah. What else do you do? Uh, I knock out a cold shower. I try to eat a ton of salad. I try not to eat till 9 a.m. in the morning. Um, and I try not to eat too late, but I got in late last night, and we ended up having an 8 p.m. dinner at a awesome Mediterranean restaurant Where? here. I don't know the name of it, but it was awesome. Who are you here with? No, I came alone. But then uh, again, like you, people always want to meet. Hey, you're going to be in LA. I, can I can I pick you up at the airport? Yeah, come on. We'll oh, so, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. So you had like you had dinner with somebody, yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Okay, and then so you so in terms of like other habits and we even okay, we're going to get to the Spartan stuff in a second. But habits are you work out at least once a day. How long is the workout minimum? Minimum an hour. Minimum an hour. Got to sweat. Okay, and then salads. As much as you can. Yeah. Do you eat meat then, or are you, are you vegan? I eat a little bit of meat. Okay, I, but I do not. eat a little bit of meat. I, I eat. Um, I probably eat meat once a week, once every two weeks. When I don't you say eat, meat, is chicken included in that? I don't really like chicken. Really? Yeah, I don't really like chicken. I like fish. Yeah, me too. Yeah. So when you say meat, it's like would be like steak or whatever. I don't even. I don't even like steak. I'll, once in a while, I'll get a burger without the bun, mm. and I'll just eat the burger. 
I like mustard on a burger and uh, me too. But it's when when I want it. I don't, I don't always want it. Do you have like do you like do you have a big appetite or is it fuel? I, ma- all- I have a massive appetite that's starting as I get older. I'm starting to thank God because I used to eat ridiculous amounts of food. That's me uh, too. Um, it's hard when you work out a lot. Yeah. Don't you get hungry? I mean, for me, I'm like starving, so I end up gaining weight because I'm like I'm yeah, I'm eat eating so much more. Yeah, I'm um I'm getting better with it. So then nine o'clock you eat. What, what's your first meal? My first meal I'll have, I'd like to have, um, believe it or not, this is a new thing. When I say new, the last three, four years is um, salad in the morning with eggs. Yeah. Is that salad weird? Salad and eggs? eggs. Yeah. Well, there's, I don't know where it came from that you're not allowed to have salad. Like, why do you I have know. to only have salad for lunch or dinner? Like, I, why I not? agree. And so I guess my message to the world is just eat more salad. And um, that's your big message for the day. Uh, for the day on, on, on the nutrition front, <laughs> yeah, we just be, eat, eat more salad. And um, I don't eat much fruit anymore. Uh, is it I because used, of the sugar content? Because of the sugar. Um, so do you feel like, but why? Is it because you I feel- I just feel better on salad than I do on fruit. Yeah, because vegetables, yeah. it's like less, yeah. yeah. So that your insulin is more stable. Yeah. So then do you eat lunch or? I'll eat lunch. I haven't, eat, I haven't eaten lunch yet today um, because you, you're so hard driving. With like, <laughs> yes. I wanted to eat and you were like, no, we have to do the podcast <laughs> yeah. now. And so, um, I, you know, it is screwing my entire I nutrition apologize. up. But okay. It's okay. I, know. Okay. I, know I haven't eaten yet today, but I, but I will. And uh, what would I have had for lunch? A Greek salad would have been amazing. I love Greek salad too. Yeah, I love too. Greek salad. Um, do you eat dairy or is that like not very a Very little. Okay. I, I will once in a while eat uh, yogurt. I like yogurt, okay. um, but not every day. How about oats? What's your what's your thing you on oats? You know what? This is surprising. I was trying to stay away from oats and I got a buddy who's a big uh, oatmeal person and I found, um, I found this oatmeal that has flaxseed in it and chia seed and everything already prepackaged, so it's easy. What is it? Uh, Bob's oatmeal. Oh, Bob's oatmeal. Yeah, and yeah, it's, it's got it's got like pre, yeah. pre pre packaged, and you just put hot water in it, and um, it's it's great. Really, it's awesome. Do you feel bloated after no, you eat it? It's awesome. Really? Yeah. I've been eating a lot of something called mush. Have you heard of that? I, yeah, I know. I it's know. Like the, I know mush. The yeah. overnight yeah. oats. It's very yeah. small. These portions, though, like yeah. nutrient dense food, is hard for me because I have I like like volume. Quantity, yeah, yeah. I'm a quantity I like person. massive yeah. volume. That's yeah. why salads for me are. But it could be a giant boring. salad. I no, I know. I yeah. eat my, the sal- oh, I, I, salad. Oh, you like salads? Yeah. yeah. I mean, I look like I'm like a horse with a trough, yeah. like literally like a bull like is size. I'm, I'm with you. You want to know yeah. other secret to salads? I don't know. Yeah. So I like capers. I don't know if you like capers. I like artichoke hearts. I love right? horse and right? like hearts of palm. Hearts of palm, right? Yeah. And then what you do is put it all in there and get a scissors, and then and just start uh, chopping the whole that. thing up with a scissors. <laughs> yes. It's and called a chopped salad, honey. It's fucking awesome. It's amazing. By the way, but the you're, scissor is better than a knife. Well, no, of course, because yeah. you're chopping it. Yeah. But you can also like take before you- It takes put, forever. Scissor's so easy. Put it in the bowl and just start very, chopping away with the scissor. That's a very smart idea. Actually, I've never tried it with scissors, but I do love the idea. So I'm a, like I, I, I'm a big believer in the salad thing. Do you like jicama? I like jicama too. What the hell is jicama? Really? So jicama. jicama is like- between an apple and a potato, but like much more water content. I don't even and know about it. I gotta, I'm gonna have a jicama. I you've never had one. jicama? No. Oh my gosh, really? Yeah. Well, I just taught you something. Yeah. Cause it, it's delicious and jicama. it's All a right. very, it's volume again. Like I need to eat food with volume. volume. Yeah. And you know what? I would prefer, I gotta tell my wife, um, because we've been doing right, I adopted three kids unofficially in the last month. Um, like, bec- really? Bec- yeah, because of the, um, God, the school program we have, they don't have boarding. And because the wrestling is so amazing, there are families that want to be there, but they can't. Oh, wow. So they want to send their boys. So where do we put our boys? So I, I said, I'll take three of them. So I had three boys living with us now on top of our four kids. So my wife's cooking a lot. So, are you joking? Yeah. And this, uh, she had one day notice. Talk about flexibility. I was like, oh, I forgot to tell you, there's three kids moving in tomorrow. Are you so, <laughs> Oh, my God. But she's awesome. And um, What did she say? Okay, I guess there's three kids moving in tomorrow. Where are they right? going to sleep? Um, we got an apartment next to our apartment, and uh, so they're in they're in that apartment. So um, wow, you must be making lots of money at Spartan. I, I don't make any money. No, we got to talk about that. I know. So um, the reason I bring it up is because she's been cooking rice with the other things. She, yeah, I like quinoa better. Me quinoa too. Quinoa is so much better. It's so, fill, it's also filling and yeah. it's much more nutrient. It's, I love it. It's very so nutrient. we got to get rid of the rice. We got to go all quinoa from that, now on. That's a good idea. Do you drink coffee? 
I don't like coffee, but I you will see me with a cup in my hand. Today I had a cup. Okay. Because 9 a.m. I was ready for my feeding. Yeah. But my guy that I was meeting had me waiting outside his house for an hour. So um, so I was like, I gotta have something. So I had coffee. Um, but I don't I don't like the taste of coffee. It's too really? bitter. Really? Yeah, I hate it. So you, how about like just in general, like caffeine, does does it help you? You don't like to you like to stay away from You know from what? Caffeine? I could drink a cup of coffee. Let's say I did drink a cup of coffee and I was tired. I pass right out. Doesn't affect me. It doesn't affect you at all. No. Wow. Okay. So wait. So let's go back now to Spartan. Okay, so here you are. You're doing all these adventure races. You think, okay, I'm going to try something so to help 20, people. So 22 years ago, 2000, I'm on our farm in Vermont. I met my wife at a race, and I'm like, you know what? So she was doing an adventure race. She happened to be at a race randomly. I was at a race I wasn't supposed to be at. It was too short of a distance. It wasn't something I was doing at that time, okay. but friends talked me into it. I think it was, no, friends talked me into it and it was on Nantucket. And I, I, I did a swim in that race that I wasn't supposed to do because it was a relay. So let's say you were on my team. I was doing the yeah. sandbag carry down the beach and then I tagged the person who did the swim, but I was standing there saying, I didn't do enough today. I'm gonna do the swim anyway. So I jumped in the swim I swam across the, the bay, and when I got on the other side, she was there, my wife was there. I met her for three seconds. I had no shoes on because the people that were officially doing the swim had shoes waiting for them, right? Because right, they, of course. I, I didn't have, have shoes waiting for me because I wasn't supposed to do the swim. You just jumped in. I just jumped in. When I came up the other side, I was like walking on rocks, and she says to me, you're gonna hurt your tootsies. And that would have been something my mother would have said. My mother was dead at this time. Oh. Yeah. So um, not only was she gorgeous, not only did I like her right away, but that word was like, I got to chase this down. So I, I, I found her. Um, How'd you find her? It was, it was work. Um, but, I, but I chased her down, um, called the company. Somebody found out a company she worked for. They had 1,500 employees. I, and and um, I got her. Yeah. Wow. Was, was, That's how, well, so, what did you do? You called the company. They called the company, um, found this girl, Courtney. Oh, I know Courtney. How did um, you know her name? Because it was on her like thing, like no, the she, badge I, or? I, I think somebody that stayed behind. I, I had left the race already. We like, we met for 11 seconds and, um, I left the race, but then the tape was playing in my head, Tootsies. And I got to, I, I, I can't believe I wouldn't follow up. And, and so then some people were still behind. I said, you gotta get me her name. Some, and, oh. and well, we got a name and we think she works here. And, and, and then, yeah, it was great. That's an amazing story. I had to lie, I had to, lie to, to rope her in. I said, oh, I'm starting an all female adventure <laughs> racing team and you looked really fit. Would you like to join the team? And I was- yeah, I Taking her. up shit, yeah. Was, yeah. And she was like, what did she say? Like, yes, no. Yeah, I said, well, we're doing a training weekend. If you want to come out for a training weekend. <laughs> you know, we got to make sure you would qualify right, for right, such right, a thing. Right, 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 right. Audition, audition for yeah, it. Exactly. That's yeah. so cute. Yeah. And it's like, what, how many years later? 20, 22 years later. 20, wow. 20, yeah. Okay, so now So Spartan. we had the farm. I got my wife. And... Um, Oh, I, so you sold the company? No, I still, have, I still have the Wall Street firm at okay. this point, but we own the farm. What were you doing on Wall Street? Were you a trader? We had a, I had a company that was um, that had fifty traders, and we we basically our, our clients were Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Merrill Lynch, and when they were uh, buying large blocks of equities or derivatives, we were uh, we were their broker. So we traded okay. between the banks. Okay. Um, How did you grow a business in that world, like Wall Street finance? Being yeah. a pool cleaner and a home ecology uh, major, H human ecology. So I, I um, oh yeah, human. It's ecology. funny. I just yeah, it's it's funny. I think about it because I think about my children, right? Our children. How how do we teach them? But again, think about the neighborhood I came from. You figure it out. You fig so basically, it, your whole life was just like just figure hustling it out. and figuring it out. Like yeah. it wasn't like there wasn't any playbook. You just kind of just figured it out. You, you, you ended up there, and you're like, okay, now what? And just yeah. one step led to another, and fire ready aim. Yeah. And so that's and your big thing, right? That's my big fire, thing. It, fire ready. ready aim. I like that. So, so, um, your other thing is if you are on time, you're late. Which and is, I see now fire late. ready aim. I see who's the actress from Australia. That's in, she's got her own. She's a superhero. Um, Oh no, not Gal. Robbie, Robbie, Rob, uh, Margot Robbie. 
Margot Robbie. Yeah, yeah. So I, I see that's her saying. She stole the saying from me. Oh I think. my gosh! Yeah. You should you should sue her. No, I don't care. No, I don't I'm, care. I'm she's, she's much more powerful than I am. Yeah. So so um, and prettier. Much prettier. Yeah. A little bit. So so um, so where were we? So oh, the farm, and I get the idea to start um thing, but I'm still on Wall Street. I'm going back and forth, and um. I start putting on races, but the races I'm putting on are 350 miles long or, or 50 miles. They're, they're crazy races. So I'm not getting. Is this a, a death race one? Death race, uh, Expedition BVI. What was on, the first one? Death race, though. First one was Expedition BVI. It was in the British Virgin Islands. It was 350 miles long. And I lost a person. And um, later. What do you mean you lost a person? So I was organizing the race. And um, apparently one of the folks that were setting the ropes we were gonna have coastaleering where somebody had to climb out of the water. Participants had to climb out of the water on ropes up the side of a cliff. And while those ropes were being set, one of our subcontractors cut his leg. So our, what? So our staff said, go to the main island, go to Tortola, go get stitches. He apparently gets in a little dinghy to go to the other island and drifts away and no one notices. So fast forward eight days, the race is over, everybody's breaking open champagne and this thing was awesome, we're having a party. And um, the staff comes over and he says, we haven't seen you know, John in eight days. I was like, well, why would you just tell me now? And they said, well, we thought he was back on Tortola, we didn't need him, he needed stitches, they tell me the story. Meanwhile, in the last eight days, been the worst storms that the British Virgin Islands has seen in like 10 years. So we had to get the Coast Guard involved, they pulled out their maps and they were like, well, if you last saw him here, based on the wind and, and, the, and, the, and the currents, we're going to go look for him. So the Coast Guard takes off in their helicopters and they find him 150 miles away on a deserted island, Little Tobago. Was he alive? Alive. So uh, Sports Illustrated does a story on, you know, true survivor. And um, how's his leg? It was fine and and we didn't get sued and so everything was good and clearly it was an omen for me not to put on races anymore um, clearly right but um but i'm a glutton for punishment so then we we did a second race and a third race and a fourth race but i couldn't get enough people to come to make money i, I wonder why <laughs> <laughs> i wonder i couldn't get it to work <laughs> and so how that is <laughs> so for 10 years i kept putting on races putting on races putting on races none of it was working how many people were showing up 20. 30. I just couldn't, I couldn't get it to work in 2000. Were you charging people? Yeah. How I much? I was trying. I was lying to people. I would tell people they were coming to a barbecue for the weekend, but <laughs> I mean, I did everything I could, but people wouldn't come. Oh my gosh. So in 2010, I changed the name to Spartan. I okay. added the obstacles. We changed the format. We made it three miles, eight miles, 10 miles, three miles, eight miles, 13 miles. And um, boom, 700 people showed up. And then really? 1,500 people showed up. Showed up where? Like, what was the first one? The first one? race was in Vermont. And, was um, it your farm, the first race? It was race? up the street from the farm. Okay. And, um, wow. Yeah. And then. How did and, you promote it? We knocked on doors. We went crazy. We did radio. We did social media. We didn't have social media back then. Yeah. In 2010, we had a little bit of social what media. What did we have? We, no, we didn't. When, when did Facebook start? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Facebook was know. going. Yeah. It Facebook? was like 2008, was? 2007. Oh yeah, MySpace, Facebook. Okay, so yeah. so basically just changing the name and just creating changing different the format levels. And making it more accessible. So it wasn't 350 miles, it was three. Right, right? much that, easier. That helped. Yeah, a little. And what happened to Death Race? I thought that was the first big one. Expedition BVI was the first big one. No, after that, oh, I mean. Then Death Race, Death Race. But again, that was a hundred people would show up to that. But in tw yeah. and that had already been running and it was something I do every year on the farm. Uh, but that's only for crazy people. And then, but 2010 was for the masses. That was Spartan. Okay. And uh, grew it, grew it, grew it. By 2015, we finally could make, we were making some money by 2015. We were- um, by Well, between two, 2010 and, and 2015, how many people were now showing up year to year? Oh, now I was getting 5,000 people, 7,000 people, 8,000 people at a race. And how many, because when, didn't a private equity company come in? They came in in 2012. They helped me keep it alive because I was running out of money. Yeah. I was burning so much money. How much does it cost to put one on? 600,000. To put on one race. Yeah. Wow. And so, yeah. but if you put that on, how much you, how much is the, 
hundred dollars. So if you have six thousand people, you break even. You're breaking even, right? So you really weren't making money. Oh, weren't you bringing in sponsors back then, or no? I was, but it, it, I just couldn't get the economics to work. Right. But um, but I kept I'm a glutton for pot. Just kept doing right, it. Kept, kept doing, doing it, it. Kept doing it. Relentless. And, um, relentless. And then um, by 2018, we were on top of the world. We we're like, oh, this is working. 2019, we bought out our competitor, Tough Mudder. Um, Bang in our chest. We did it. We fought through. That's, and I was going to ask you the, the the when you guys were like neck to neck. Like were you guys who was more back then? Were you guys like they neck were beating to neck? Us. They were beating. They us. were. They were beating us everywhere. Yeah. Was it because it was easier? Or? There were Harvard kids that were much more savvy with social media and the internet, and we were we were Flintstones. And right, right, we, right. We were really good at putting on events and organizing trailers and trailer lanes and logistics uh, because I came from a construction right background, but but um. But I would say we were not uh, world class at digital media, um, but uh, they were they were a little too full of themselves. Uh, they pulled a bunch of money out personally for themselves, mm. and it hurt their business. The opportunity came up to acquire them. We did, uh, but then the pandemic hit, and the pandemic uh, cost us fifty million dollars, which we didn't have because we never made fifty million dollars in those in those years. Uh, the government was kind enough to have all these programs to help us. Um, they wait, went, wait, wait, why 50 million? Why? Where's well, that so number? imagine, imagine in 2020, right? Imagine having sold $35 million worth of tickets, right? Already. Cause the first quarter, January, February, March, I sold $35 million worth of tickets. They're all getting ready for their races, their training. Because how many races a year are you putting on at this At that point? point, I'm doing 350 events around the world, 45 countries. Because because I want to make sure people understand, because I didn't know this until I did my research, that Spartan is like the umbrella company, right? Yep. And then you have a bunch of different races underneath it, right? Other, other brands. Under, and other, other brands. Yep. So like, there's so, like Anaheim Spartan, there's... Oh, yeah, yeah. So, so Spartan Race has a whole series of races around the world. Right, three yeah. mile, eight mile, thirteen mile, right. hundreds of events uh, across all countries. Then there's Spartan Trail, which was without obstacles. Trail runs all over the world. Then there's Tough Mudder, right? Right. Um, then there's Deca, which is another cool fitness event we should get you involved in. I've never tried that. Amazing. And then, um, and so anyway, imagine all those people signing up and uh, spending thirty-five million dollars wow. with us, and then every race around the world gets canceled. And so um, customers were not forgiving. They were like losing their minds, upset at us. And we were like, we didn't cancel the events. Right. Uh, we want our money back. Well, there's no way for me to give, I spent the money already. Like I had employees, I had trucks, I had insurance. Like put, people, put, put people that don't on. understand business think that when the event goes on that week and that's when I write all the checks. No, the checks were been written over the last 12 months. Totally. Right. And, and uh, so, so anyway. How I many had, employees did you have? 600, so I right. had to, or 500, 512 at that point. I had to um, promise all those people, those 350,000 people, that they will get an entry to another race. But you know what, I'm gonna even do one better because we're not bad people. We're gonna give you two races. The next two races are free on us oh, yeah. because we screwed you because of the pandemic. So now I just gave $70 million worth of entries away. So now I got to, when the world starts back up, put on those races and not collect any money, right? I got to put on all those events. Wow. So, um, so anyway, so uh, no one really understands, like anybody out there watching or listening to this that thinks, oh my God, Joe made us do burpees. He's a, he's a, you have no idea the, the burpees I've had <laughs> to do to get this business uh, to continue on. Uh, but you know what? Like I'm not in jail. Right? You're not, you're not I'm, I'm not dead. No. I'm not living in Siberia. It's not 30 below. Like, and my kids are healthy and my wife's like still talking to me. So, so like, it's not that I, bad. It's actually. not that bad. So wait, how did you get yourself up? So, but that's still happening. How did you, how did you crawl out of that? We are literally knife fighting every day no, and, and, fin and finally seeing the, the light at the end of the tunnel now. Oh, right. But, but, but the how? Last six, oh no, I, I, I owe um, the government uh, $25 million. I mean, we've got our challenges ahead of us, but, um, but I'm di we're digging out, we're digging out. We're knock on wood, um, it's, um, it's metal. Yeah. Uh, knock on wood somewhere. <laughs> how about here, how about here, how about here? Knock on wood. Yeah. Um, it's, looking, it's looking better, so that's good.
Well, then you're for sure staying with me next time you come to L.A. You have yeah. to save that money on hotel. I, I didn't know. realize it was I that know. brutal. I know. I wish I wish you would have invited me. I, I mean, uh, here I listen, am spending could, all this money on hotels just I to know. do this podcast. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. You, well, you go with me, honey. So <laughs> it's really, it's you to blame. But anyway, so then how, so then it starts up again. And um, the private equity, how much do they own of the business? So we before the pandemic. Because, Who owns it, by the way? What's the private equity company? So at, at that time, it was called Raptor. Um, okay. They were the, they were the guys that came in in 2011, 2012. But we bought them out when we bought Tough Mudder. We were on top of the world. We were feeling so good. We bought them out. Oh wow! And so um, everybody got paid. I've yet to. Again, I'm not asking anybody to play a small violin for me. No one should feel bad. I've got the most amazing life. Amazing family. Everything's great. But um, I've yet to take a dividend uh, from this company in 22 years. You've so, not um, made any money I've off of this? I've only put money in the business. I've only put money in. I've never taken money out. So, um, how are you, how are you surviving and I'm adopting I'm, three kids in, in a way? literally, world? thank God I made a little bit of money on wall street. Thank God. And I've literally been burning through savings this whole time. So, um, are you joking? No, no. Cause I would have thought by now you would have been like a multi, like a multi like gazillionaire, a billion, like a billionaire. Yeah. Like, like, a, like, you, like, like, like you're the founder up, of Spartan. I should have pulled up in like a Rolls Royce or something. Yeah. Right. Or like a, or like a, like Bugatti or something. something. Yeah. Two Bugattis. Yeah. I go towing one behind the, right. <laughs> yes, like exactly. I should have had. Uh, instead I have a goat and a chicken on a farm. So. Uh, I'm like, <laughs> by the way, this is impossible. So like, I would think the founder of Spartan that is like the most well-known famous adventure racing company in the world yeah. would have like, two like got, a pot two. to piss in basically. Yeah, no, I had to use your toilet. I know, I know, <laughs> it's true. And you have an apartment in Florida. And I have an apartment but in Florida. But you have a farm. I do have a farm. How big is yeah. the farm? It's big, it's big, but I paid, um, I mean, we're having, look, I, I go back and forth how much I wanna tell you, but I, I see all these people on Instagram and all these people, like they're all standing in front of whether it's their own oh, or some rented bullshit, Ferrari please. and all this stuff. And I was actually thinking about it today because here in the Hollywood Hills, I saw a Ferrari and I thought, I am so opposite all these people that like, I, I show off a picture of me in a chain or a kettlebell <laughs> and they, right? And they are standing in front of, I said, but I thought for a minute, maybe I should stand next to this Ferrari and make believe like I have a Ferrari. Maybe that would be interesting to people. I don't know. No. And, and, and so I bought that. We, my wife and I, we bought that farm in 2000. Um, we bought that farm in 2000, 2001 for $400,000. It's a 700 acre farm. It's unbelievable. People come there and think I'm a billionaire. Yeah. It's $400,000. You know, you don't remember. No one remembers. Real estate used to be cheap. Yeah, it's true. You know? Right. But if you sold that farm now. You know, it's not, um, it's not Beverly Hills. It's not New York City. It's the middle of nowhere, Vermont. And the reality is um, not everybody wants to live in Vermont, which is why I like it so much. Exactly. Right. That's why. Uh, so it's not, it's not like. Or Orlando. Or Orlando. <laughs> so. Yeah. But not to say- And okay. again, I'm not asking anybody, like we, we have a great life and I could pay my bills. Um, but how, seriously, like how? I mean, if you were on Wall Street literally 22 years ago, and you owe all that money, how do you not take even a small salary? So, so um, from 2000 to 2010, while I was building this business, I, was, I still had my foot in Wall Street. So I was able to pay all my bills and start this business using my money I was making in finance. What, right? Yeah. So I still had that career going, right? Um, but it's over now. It ended, I would say it officially ended around 2011, where it was like all in with Spartan. So it's been, it's been 11 years of just burning through savings. And that's a lot of savings. It's a lot of savings. So or, or I'm very frugal. I mean, we only eat celery. Yeah, I was gonna say, right? Or <laughs> big salads of like, just yeah. like iceberg lettuce even, not even like the organic. You can't you go, know? Okay. kale's too expensive. Yeah, I was gonna say, so is it just iceberg or That's maybe it. a romaine if you get lucky, if it's like a, yeah. a special evening? If I'm feeling, if I'm feeling frisky. Yeah, holy moly, that's crazy. Yeah. So that, that really, like that blows my mind actually. It really it's not does. Even, it's not even believable. And, and the thing is, um, most people that, I mean, you know better than anybody, you've started businesses, would just have packed it in. They would have just said, and I didn't tell you, in t so we bought out our partner, but along the way in 2015 or 2016, Hearst became an investor as well. So right now Hearst owns a little piece. We didn't buy them out. 
Um, they're, oh. an they're an amazing partner. We bought out the early investor. Um, Hearst is still a partner. Uh, they own roughly 18% of the company. What, what's, um, what magazines belong to them? They own a ton of magazines. They own a piece of ESPN. They're oh. wildly successful. They've been around 100 years and they're the greatest people in the world. Um, they challenge me on everything, but they don't um, drive me crazy. So um, that's good. And they and you know, I got an immediate phone call during the pandemic and said, "Don't worry, we'll be here for you." So um, that's amazing. Yeah. So, so then you basically get um, you have Hearst as a partner. What other sponsors and partnerships do you guys have? I don't know. We got a whole list of um, sponsors and partners now. Obviously, we had more pre-pandemic, but now now they seem the doors seem to be uh, they're knocking on the doors again. Now they cause, are because the world's coming back. When do you think you can be you per personally can start taking money out of the company and be I, I, even I, a salary um, of fifty thousand? No, I, I'm sorry. I get paid. I just don't get paid like a CEO. Like profit. Of, of a, yeah, yeah, exactly. Oh, so you take a salary. I take a salary. Yep. Okay. Um, so I would say I could probably make some money. Um, I mean, we owe the government money still from the pandemic. So I'm probably 2025. Uh, wow. if, all, if all continues on. So probably, you know, three years from now, two and a half, three years from now. Right. So are people then like, it now because now people are itching to do something and getting out like has a pendulum now swung completely the other direction and now well, you're gonna i mean be i would busier? say i would say next year i should be normalized back to what 2019 looked like so it's not the pendulum's not swinging to a point where i was like oh my god this is like yeah. it's gonna just get back to 2019 next year um and the reason i believe that is first of all the worse the economy does the better for us if the stock market was completely crashed, that's great for us because you're going to not go to Europe on a trip. You're not sure. going to go to Disney. You're going to come and crawl under barbed wire for $150. Exactly. It's like it's like cheap entertainment. Cheap entertainment. Yeah. Um, so that's number one. Number two, the issue is with people not back in offices, if you and I were working in the same office, you're excited about doing Tough Mudder this week in a Spartan. You're telling me, and I'm like, I'm in. I'm, I'm doing it with you, but you're not in an office. And those conversations are not, not necessarily happening on happening on zooms so um so that's a challenge yeah it's um, true. and then the third challenge is this huge volume of people that were crazy about our races they've literally grown roots on their couches the last two years yeah and totally. so and so when we look at our numbers they're almost all new people brand new people and and the the, the legacy racers like they need a kick in the ass they need to get you know back in the game. How are you? How what's your plan or marketing plan or what's your model to get them back engaged? We we, um, we ordered um, a thousand black vans from Amazon and we're going to just drive to their houses and <laughs> and rip them off their couches. Kind of like what you do with your children every morning exactly. at five o'clock. Yes. Okay. Just up, a, if yeah. your doorbell rings three <laughs> times, it's us. <laughs> oh my gosh! And I wouldn't be surprised if that's actually accurate and true. That's amazing. All right, so we're gonna have to wrap this because we do have to, you know, you have what to would, be on What would Mary. part three cover? Like we're up to the point, we're up to the point where we covered Spartan, we covered the kids. Now I, I have like a lot of intricate questions, but I'm not even gonna tell you, then you won't okay. come back. Okay, right. Okay. fine. I so, was thinking for the audience, like what part, why, uh, why uh, they should why? be excited. I wanna part. talk about your CNBC show, Okay. right? That's which a is a one. big one. Yeah. Um, is there or is there not going to be a season two? Dun, dun, it's, dun, gonna be, dun. It's, gonna, it's gonna be up to everybody out there. If uh, how if are the ratings? Ratings were okay. They weren't great. They did better during the afternoon than they did at night. I just think it's about getting people to know the show exists, the education piece. It can take a while because it's a new show and people may not know who you are, yeah. but the st your style, I think is exactly what people actually are attracted to in TV. Cause it's yeah. like super extreme. You I know, like that. that's I like my, that. that's my opinion, but we can yeah. talk offline. Yeah. Um, there's other things too, but you know what? We're going to wrap it and you're going to come back. This is now going to be part three, part three with Joe because he's so, you're so amazing. I, I, I'm like, Thank this you. is one of my favorites of favorites because yeah. you're so hardcore and like so nice at the same time. You're like, I, you're so likable. I got to tell my wife. She thinks I'm I'm going to call her and yeah, tell you her. you should call her. I will. Give me yeah. her number. I'm yeah, serious. I'll text you and her. Yeah, please do it. All right. I mean, this, okay, so just for the, okay, so as you're texting me your wife's phone number, how do people find, if they want to do a Spartan yes, um, race? Yeah, yeah. So anybody out there that's a friend of yours, um, let's see. Uh, I'm going to give you all until September 15th. 
Um, Not a friend of mine, because maybe this won't be up at that point. Tell them um, about where to look into Spartan or well, you. Well, you could just send me an email. Uh, if okay. you write me an email, it's got to be one or two sentences only. If it's longer than that, I'm not going to read it. Joe at Spartan.com. No. J-O-E at Spartan.com. Shoot me an email. And then um, if you want to do a race, um, they'll get in touch with you. No, 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 not me. Well, just, just, say, say, just hear me out for a second. Okay. To get in touch with you after you listen or watch this episode. You put all their names in a spreadsheet. They're all racing on me. It's free. Um, but, but don't keep it out there forever. You got yourself in trouble the first time with this $70 million thing. Why would you do this again? I don't mind. It doesn't matter. Okay. Um, happy to do it. Um, at the end of the day, when I think about why I do this, it's because of the emails I get that say, Hey, I'm back with my husband. I'm back with my wife. I lost 300 pounds. I no longer drink. I no longer do drugs. It really doesn't have anything about the money. Like if you receive those emails, that's current, that's how I get paid. So, um, do I want to be sustainable and be able to make my payroll? Of course, but but um, I got to pinch myself. I got the I'm the luckiest person on the planet. So just get just get people to do the race, and if and if the price or I don't have the money or whatever the friggin' excuse is, they're going to come up with like let's not let's not put barriers in front of them. Let's just get them there. Get them there. Yeah. yeah. Um, and if you want to look, if you want to like know more about Joe, go, he's on now social media all the time. He's doing huh. live workouts. I don't know if you're still doing the no, live I workouts. I don't do them anymore. But yeah. your content is great. Thank you. It's at Joe DeSena, D E. Oh, it's at, um, at, I don't even know what it is. At real Joe DeSena, maybe. Maybe. Something like that. Okay, yep. good. And, sp- and go to the stuff, go mm-hmm. to the Spartan website. Cause there's like a million different kinds of, um, events. events. Oh, check out, um, check out, um, Project Seven at Spartan. Check out Project Seven. What I did was I assembled our seven toughest events around the world, and I challenge anybody out there to, to tackle one or two or five or seven of these. Um, th- th- it's pretty unbelievable. You got to see I assembled these these seven. That's amazing. Crazy, crazy. By the way, you should put a whole group together. Here's what we should do. You need to put a whole group together and bring them to the death race. End of death June. race. Yeah, end of June twenty three. You want to have some fun. We bring the cameras. We bring a whole group under you, and they do the death race. I'll do it. But does right. it have to be the death race? We do the death race. One? Yeah, no, this death race on because it's on the farm. Can't we? Okay, well, um, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Joe, I love you, and right. goodbye. Thank you for watching Habits and Hustle. Please watch another video here and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already by pressing the button below. Hosted by Jennifer Cohen, visionaries tune in, you can get to know them. Be inspired, this is your moment. Excuses, we ain't having that. The Habits and Hustle podcast, powered by Habitnest.